Uh, so we'll talk about that and what we're seeing in terms of advanced parole. Um, and then a very common question we're getting right now is for people that got their H-1B approved with the October 1st start date, what if maybe they lost that job and they want to go back to F-1 status? Is that an option? How can they do it? Um, we're also continuing to see revocations for people who had uh, multiple registrations submitted in the H-1B lottery. Uh, we're seeing notice of intent to revoke being issued for 2022 lottery cases, notice of intent to deny being issued for 2023 lottery cases. Um, what can you do in that situation? What's kind of the status of that? And um, we want to talk about the situation of a job loss when you're on H-1B and you have your 60 day grace period. What if you're running out of that time? Should you file a change of status to B2 or is it better to exit the country? And what are your options to get back to H-1B status after that? Lastly, um, can my employer withdraw my I-140 petition? There are certain uh, differences and how that uh, might impact your I-140 petition, your priority date, your ability to get H-1B extensions and get an H-4 EAD depending on when a uh, withdrawal happens of an approved I-140. Emily, the first thing, the good news is that you said that the EAD got approved for you in three days. Even though they said that they will start doing it in October 1st, you filed the application on September uh, 27th. Uh, that mm -hmm. they received the USCIS and they approved on September 30th. That means they started doing the uh, H-1B, uh, sorry, five years EADs. That's very good news. What's the bad news, Emily? Yeah, the bad news is uh, it did not come with an AP approval notice at the same time. And when I checked the AP uh, receipt number to see what the status of that case is, it shows that it's still pending. So it does not look like they're issuing five-year combo cards. Um, I did have someone reach out to me on Twitter that said they did get um, the EAD and AP approvals at the same time. The EAD was issued for five years. The AP came separately for only two years. Um, so as of now, I don't think they're doing the five-year EAD AP combo cards, but that remains to be seen. It's just our first one that came into our office. So that's um, those people who already applied, who's pending, most probably they may get the five-year extension right now. Some of the people are contemplating to refile it. I would rather have them wait for it rather than refile the application. But it's up to their call if they refile MD. Because yeah. even, even if they refile it, at the most, if they, they may deny the second application, which is not going to have any negative impact on it. Now, Emily, the million dollar question that comes is that I am on STEM OPT. My uh, H-1B got approved with October 1st start date and I lost the job before October 1st. In that scenario though, am I on OPT, STEM extension or OPT? Am I on, on H-1B on October 1st or October 10th? Yeah, I think it depends on which one you want to be in. There's, I think, a way that you can potentially choose one or the other. Um, I think it partly depends on whether the company has already requested withdrawal. Um, in the event when these kind of terminations happen early in the summer and the company immediately notifies USCIS, a lot of times we see the withdrawal confirmation come through before October 1st. That situation is very clear that you're still on STEM OPT. The H-1B is never going to take effect because it was actually confirmed withdrawn before October 1st. Uh, the more difficult situation is what we see more commonly, and that's when people lose their job later in the summer, or closer to October 1st, and maybe the company did submit that withdrawal request hasn't been processed by USCIS weeks and weeks and weeks, sometimes months to process those. And so it raises the question, if the company requested the withdrawal, but the withdrawal has not actually been processed yet, should I consider myself an H-1B status or should I go back to OPT or can I go back to OPT? Um, so you, in my mind, you can choose. If you want to go back to OPT, what typically happens is your uh, SEVIS record gets automatically terminated on October 1st because the system still thinks that your H-1B got approved and you're no longer a student. You have to go to your school's official and say, hey, 
my H-1B has been withdrawn, please request a data fix in the SEVIS system. And the problem is ICE nowadays typically wants to receive the kind of withdrawal from USCIS before they will do that data fix. So until your, your data fix is done, you are terminated in the SEVIS system. You have an OPT card that is not expired, but you have no ability to get a new I-20 to confirm that your status is good. You have no way to travel. Um, it's just a very limbo situation and you have no way to force USCIS to issue that withdrawal confirmation. Um, so it's kind of a, a, an in-between situation that you may want to do if you have a lot of time left on your OPD, OPT. But another option is consider yourself in H-1B status on October 1st, and because your employment has been terminated, you get the 60-day grace period of H-1B time that starts on October 1st. And you can file a transfer within 60 days, so you have till November 30th. Um, you don't have to submit pay statements because you don't have any from the time that you started your H-1B. Um, you might get a request for evidence or you may want to submit pay statements to show that you properly maintained your OPT status and didn't exceed the 90 day employment limit or the 150 day employment limit. Uh, but beyond that, you should be eligible to transfer your H-1B. I do it every year around this time of year with multiple petitions. Um, I know that there are some companies that are nervous to do that and are not willing to do the transfer. But if you do have a company that's willing to do the transfer, it can be done. Um, Emily, do um, you have any more things to cover on this one? Can I move to the next topic? No, nope, I think we can move on. Um, when the when the H-1B, when you lose the job on H-1B, of course, everybody knows that if the I-94 validity is there, you do have a 60 day grace period in which period you can find another job and you have another, if you don't find a job, what are the options that you have? Typically, if you have a job, definitely go for it, get the H-1B approval. But if you don't have it, if you have the H-4 option or L-2 option, absolutely go for it. Don't even consider the B-2 option or going to India, go for the H-4 option or L-2 option. If you don't have those options, then absolutely, you should consider B-2 option. You can also consider going outside the country uh, if you don't get any job. Now, people ask the questions like if I go to B2, uh, if I apply for B2, what is the process involved in it? You can file a B2 application online. You can fill as much as possible and then have a consultation with the lawyer to see how to file it if you have questions about it. Um, and uh, within the 60 day period, you need to file the B2 application. Now, uh, if you can file for B2 for up to six months, so you can stay in this country for up to six months. Uh, and in between, if you get a job, you can transfer your application from H-1B, uh, sorry, from B-2 application, even though the B-2 is not approved into H-1B. Uh, since February, March of 2023, USCIS has been approving the change of status, even when the B-2 is pending, we have no problems until now. So you can change the status within the United States into H-1B without any trouble. And if you choose to go back to India, um, you can. Uh, you can always come back. If you have an I-140 approval, then you are not subject to the lottery at any point of time. You can always come back at any point of time. Now, if you are have do not have an I-140 approval, though, now the question that is asked that comes very common to me is that can I come back to United States without going through the lottery system? You can. However, whatever time period that you have used out of the six years, the leftover time period is what you can use to get back to the H-1B. For example, if you are in United States on four years on H-1B, now you are leaving to India and you want to come back on H-1B, can you get a three years H-1B since you don't have the I-140 approval? The answer is no, you can't unless you go through the lottery system, which requires that you must stay one year outside the country and come back. But without going through the lottery system, you can come back on H-1B. However, you will be limited only for two years of stay because you already used up the four years of the H-1B. You didn't went through the lottery again, so you're only subject to have only two years of H-1B. Even when you go to the B-2 application, you don't have to go through the lottery system. The same rule, what I told you, is applicable, where you can come back on H-1B and will not have any problem in there. And if you have an I-140 approval, the six-year rule is not applicable. You can get back to H-1B at any point of time, absolutely not a problem. 
Yeah, and I think people really should consider the B2 option, especially if they don't have a valid H-1B visa stamp anymore. Maybe they've been you know, in the U.S. and did their extension not too long ago, so they never got that stamped, and now they've lost the job. If you exit the country, whenever you do get that new employer to file for you, once that's approved, you still have to go to the consulate, get your visa stamp before you can come in versus staying in the U.S., filing that change of status to B-2. As soon as you get that new job offer, the new company can file a premium processing H-1B, requesting a change of status from B-2 back to H-1B, get the approval in two weeks, and you can get back to work right away instead of having to go for visa stamping. Emily, coming to the main, uh, one of the main topic, Emily, is the multiple filings of H-1Bs. Uh, we are seeing an uptick of the H-1B revocations right now. Um, we have seen some H-1B revocations, especially somewhere in July, August, September. July, August, we have seen a lot of revocations. Now we are seeing a lot of revocations. So for anybody who is involved in multiple filings of H-1B, though, you need to consult a lawyer immediately. The reason is that even if they didn't revoke your H-1B right now, there is a good chance they're going to revoke it at a later date. You may want to have plan B. What are you going to do with it? Now, what is a multiple filing of H-1B? I will explain you. Now, if you are work, if you are working for company A and you have filed H-1Bs with multiple companies, the multiple companies do not have to be related companies. They don't have to be sister companies though. Even if, you, if they are not related companies and sister companies, then you will be subject to the multiple filings. Now, there are very rare exceptions. The rare exceptions are mostly when a person who is an OPT or STEM extension are working for two companies. So that happens a lot of times. Sometimes, very rarely, the, the, on STEM extension, people can work for two companies. And then two companies, two different companies, unrelated companies, filed in H-1B that may be allowed in certain circumstances. But especially if you are working for one company and you have filed for multiple H-1Bs, you need, even if you got your H-1B approved right now, they may revoke your H-1B, very good possibility for it. You need to consult an immigration lawyer. What are the alternative options? Emily, we are also seeing that when people are going, even though the H-1B is not revoked, when they go for sampings, they are having difficulty in getting the H-1B approval. They're issuing a 231G. They're issuing a lifetime ban for them, saying that they have uh, they have used unlawful methods in obtaining the immigration benefits. That is considered to be misrepresentation, fraudulent misrepresentation, and they are unable to ever come back into the United States. So people need to be cautious about it. When you're going for stamping, you really need to go for stamping. What are your options on it if you don't want, if they don't allow you to come into the United States? So anybody who's involved in multiple filings should contact an immigration lawyer to see the, what are the alternative actions. They may, we may not sometimes find a solution for you. It's not that we have a, something in our pocket. Oh, you come to our office, you pay us a consultation. We'll just give you a solution that's going to be forever good. It may not be. Sometimes we will give you an option where you can plan your right. If you're not going to get your H-1B or you're staying in the United States, what are your plans? You're better off making the plan B you be, be, pre, be prepared for plan B at this point of time. Yeah, and I want to add, I, I'm seeing more and more recently that um, the employers that are getting these notice of intent to revoke for the multiple registrations are not telling their employee. And so, you know, you have no idea until all of a sudden you get a phone call from your employer saying, oh, by the way, we got a, a, a notice of intent to revoke two months ago. We didn't tell you. And now your H-1B is revoked. Now it's too late to do anything. It's already revoked. Um, so it is very important for people who suspect that that may have happened in their case to continually monitor your case status on the USCIS.gov website, because if you see that a notice of intent to revoke has been issued, now you can take action before the revocation actually happened. If you have an option to change status to some other visa, maybe to an H-4 or an F-1 or a B-2 or something, um, you can do that before the revocation actually happens so that you don't fall out of status versus waiting until your employer tells you after it's already revoked and they didn't bother to tell you that they got an intent to revoke. It's a very dangerous situation to be in. 
Yeah, and then you can create a USCIS account where you can have an alert if anything on that particular receipt notice comes in. You may even get a text and email messages. That probably will be a good idea. We have seen that the employers do not share the notice of intent to revoke. And one of the main reasons we see is that in the notice of intent to revoke, they're not going to only list your name in it. They are listing 100 names in some cases or 50 names saying that the same 50 cases were being filed by different, different companies uh, and then how they are related to each other companies. Um, and they don't want to release that secret to you though, so they don't really they don't reveal that intent to revoke and there's nothing you can do about it you can file a freedom of information you may get the information you may not get the information but you should you should take a, uh, you should try to be prepared what is your plan of action if your h1b gets revoked um, the problem is that can you just go to a new company and everything is going to be ever good for you no that's not true the reason is that um, if the first H1B has been revoked, that means you are not counted to the H1B cap. All subsequent H1Bs will be revoked. So even if you have moved to company B, you got a H1B approval with company B, there is a good chance that they're going to revoke the company B H1B or when you extend the H1B from company B, they are going to revoke. They're not going to extend it or when you want to transfer from company B to company C, they're not going to transfer it. So be watchful about it. Emily, on the final topic unless you have any question uh, on the on this is that on the i-140 um a lot of people ask this question can an employer withdraw the i-140 after 180 days has been approved now we already know that if the i-140 has been not been withdrawn within 180 days you can use it for extending the h1 uh, extend transferring to company b transferring to company d e f g h I, and so on and so forth and you can still use that I-140 I approval to file a H-4 EAD with company B, even though I-140 has been approved, if it's not been withdrawn for 180 days. Now, a lot of people get panicked, Emily, when the, they see the I-140 getting withdrawn after 180 days. They say, whoa, my I-140 is withdrawn now. I'm going to... I can't extend it. How can the company withdraw it? They can't withdraw it. Is that true? Can you explain how the company can withdraw after 180 days and what will be the effect on the employee if it's been withdrawn after 180 days? Yeah, technically a company can withdraw an I-140 at any time. They can withdraw it the day after they file it. They can withdraw it the day after it gets approved. They can withdraw it a year after it gets approved. They can withdraw it for any time for any reason. The difference is the effect of that withdrawal. If the withdrawal happens before 180 days, although you still get to keep your um, priority date, you lose the ability to extend your H-1B beyond the six-year limit and you lose the ability to get the H-4 EAD extensions. However, if the withdrawal happens after 180 days, it's still withdrawn, but the effect of that withdrawal does not um, remove your ability to get those continued H1 extensions or the H4 EAD. So after 180 days, they can still withdraw it, but even though it's withdrawn, you can still extend your H1B beyond the six year limit with any company. Your spouse can still get the H4 EAD and you still get to keep your priority date. The effect of that withdrawal is that you just can't file the 485 when your priority date finally becomes current. Let's go to questions, Emily, unless you have something. Right. Uh, questions that came from YouTube, Tania Wazi. Uh, I'm currently on, uh, I'm currently an initial OPT. I'm working on unpaid, uh, unpaid role. Is that allowed? Yeah. In the initial OPT, that is the first 12 months of OPT, the, you are allowed to be on an unpaid role as long as it is in the same education for which you have been uh, you have been trained for for example if you have master's in computer science if you're working in computer field unpaid fee un unpaid is absolutely allowed in the first 12 months now post um, the the stem extension opt requires payment though but the initial thing is fine um chintin has a question about that i-140 withdrawal and it's what is the benefit to an employer of withdrawing the i-140 they don't get the filing feedback, so what's the point? Is it just out of spite? Um, there's a weird situation where it might be beneficial to the company. 
And that's uh, when they have to establish that they have the ability to pay the salary offered for all of their other I-140 sponsored employees. So anytime a company files an I-140 petition, they always have to be able to establish that they have the ability to pay the salary of that worker. Um, sometimes USCIS says, show us that you have the ability to pay the salaries of every I-140 you've ever filed. And that becomes very uh, burdensome for a company to dig through its records for former employees to show that they had the ability to pay. So in that situation, they may inform USCIS that uh, they're withdrawing that I-140 because the person is no longer with the company. Then they don't have to show that ability to pay uh, for that particular I-140 petition. It's really the only main reason for it. Otherwise, yeah, it's kind of out of spite, I would say. A uh, question from David that comes in is that uh, uh, if the L-1B extension gets delay, denied, will it, can it be affect the 485 application which is pending? Uh, technically not, but because even though the L-1B is an non-immigrant visa uh, and uh, uh, the green card is, is, is an immigrant visa though, However, it definitely plays a role on the officer who is going to adjudicate the 485 application. When the L1B has been denied, it may negatively impact a little bit and may create some doubts in the officer to issue an RFE though. But typically what we say is that if you have an EAD though, you don't need an L1B extension. Don't, don't try to go on L1B extension. That's what I would recommend. And you said that if, um, David also asked this question that if the EAD is approved, can I withdraw the L1B? Absolutely, you can. David also asked another question that his dates of filing, dates of filing is right now uh, January of 2023. Uh, can it uh, can it go to July of 2023? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they, even though it's January of 2023, it can keep moving though. Um, the priority dates and dates of filing can keep moving back and forth. There's nothing, there's, it's very hard for us to control that. Uh, Yakumi says the AOS was filed in October 2020 and now he's moving to a different state but with the same employer. He's saying the attorney is a little bit hesitant saying that the perm is only for a specific work location and you may need to explain it if you're called in for an interview. Well, just like AC21 allows someone whose 485 has been pending for 180 days to move their green card process entirely to a new employer. You can move your green card process entirely to a new location with the same employer. The same rule applies. So AC21 portability applies in this situation. If you want to avoid questions at the interview, you can have your employer submit a supplement J form even though they're the same employer that sponsored the I-140 and the 485, and they can just specify that you're working in a new location. Same thing happens if you get promoted uh, with the same company and you're not in the same position anymore. That same company could submit a supplement J to document that the job offer still qualifies, even though it's different than what was on your 485. So I don't see any issue at all, even though the perm is for a different work location because you qualify for AC-21 at this point. Uh, Ranjit has this question. His child is 16 year old, got a GCEAD. Can the child work part time on GCEAD? Absolutely. I'm assuming the child is protected under the Child Service Protection Act, which I guess you already know what that is by this time. Absolutely. The child can work on GCEAD. Child is 16 year old. Absolutely. They can work. Arvind has this question that if I move to B, if I file a B2 application, can I come back to H1B without leaving the United States? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Uh, Sagar says, how similar does the job have to be for I-485 portability? Would a management analyst in the healthcare field be similar to a QA analyst in the healthcare field? And how often have you seen rejections for portability? Well, I'll say in 20 years, I have never seen a rejection under AC21 portability. Have you ever seen one? Yes, I've seen one uh, where what? the guy was a software professional, um, but he was working as a restaurant manager and um, he filled out a liquor uh, license application indicating that he is the, the only job he does 
is the restaurant manager. And then uh, the RFE came in, how come your how come this guy, uh, show me how this uh, restaurant manager is related to software professional. I tried as best as possible, but I failed. <laughs> I think. Yeah, that one might That's, be a bit of a stretch. Uh, we yeah. definitely, it's not the title that's important, it's the job duties themselves. So I can't say a management analyst and a QA analyst would be similar enough without seeing all of the job duties. Um, but generally it is very liberally construed so that as long as you're kind of in the same basic field, um, generally we've not had any issues. Uh, Druvit has this question, um, is it good enough for me to file a H-1B within 60 days after I lose the job or is it necessary that I should start the job with a new company? The answer to the question is you have to start the job within 60 days by filing. You can't just file an application and not work for the next six months. That's not allowed. You're supposed to start your work within 60 days from the time you lose the job. Um, Jagman says my 485 was filed in June 2023 with a 2011 priority date. Already got his EAD, which that's pretty fast, but no progress on the AP or the green card itself. Any guidance? Uh, well, that's completely normal. Uh, processing times for both the 485 and the I-131 are still terrible um, ever since COVID. Uh, so there's not really anything you can do when it is well, you can't do anything with USCIS when it's still within the normal processing time. Because if you look on their website, it'll ask, tell you, you can select what the processing times are supposed to be. You can enter your received date and it'll tell you when you can first make an inquiry about your case. And most of the time it'll say sometime in 2025, which is ridiculous. What you can do um, is file a lawsuit for interim benefits delay. That's the advanced parole delay. Um, because we're seeing those processing times are just unreasonable. Why does it take 18 months to issue a simple travel document when they can issue an EAD in three days? Why not just approve them together? Wouldn't that be so much easier? Um, so we are routinely filing these lawsuits and uh, they've been quite succeeding the delayed advanced paroles approved. Um, on the green card itself, uh, there's some potential issues with uh, depending on where you live and what service center the case is at, whether you can file a lawsuit and it would be successful. So you may just have to wait on that. Some people try to do expedite requests. We don't really see much um, positive result of expedite requests. Um, you can reach out to your congressman. We're not seeing much positive result from that. So the lawsuits are the best thing that can be done right now. Um. The gentleman got a green card, Satyan got a green card, an EB2 category. Now he's losing a job. Will it affect his citizenship application? Absolutely not. It will not, your, it will not affect your citizenship application. It will not affect your green card application. Not only that, if you lose the job, you can file for unemployment benefits and get the unemployment benefits. It's perfectly legal to do so. No problem for it. Rajesh says if the primary H-1B and an H-4 change of status plus EAD are all applied together in premium, and then there's an RFE on either the H-1 or the H-4, would the Etikuni settlement still apply to get them all processed at the same time? Um, so typically if the RFE is on the H-1, obviously the H-4 can't be approved until the H-1B is approved. So once the H-1B RFE is responded to, they should all be approved together at the same time. The opposite is not true. If the RFE is on the H-4, they will go ahead and approve the H-1B within the premium processing time frame, and then the H-4 gets processed whenever it gets processed. Um, so it is important to try to avoid getting an RFE on the H-4 or the H-4 EAD so that it can all be approved together. Um. Anti-matter has this question, can somebody apply for EAD if the priority date is not current? The only thing is called, it's called compelling circumstances EAD. It's definitely not a status. If you have H1B, we don't recommend that you move on to compelling circumstances EAD. If are under limited circumstances, you can apply for the EAD, but it's called compelling circumstances EAD. 
you can google about it or you can look into one of the uh, one of the information that we have provided in the youtube company circumstances ead we have uh, presented i think you can look into that uh snigda has this question how long it's taking for the lca processing time for the h1b transfer um, it's taking approximately uh, seven days uh, for us, uh, one week to get an LC approval right now. Um, Dory says, can we use uh, automatic revalidation to return to the USA multiple times? I used it once last year and I don't have the visa stamp on my passport. There is no restriction on how many times you can use um, automatic visa revalidation. So it's valid for any trip to Canada or Mexico that's for less than 30 days where you do not apply for a visa stamp um, and you return back to the U.S. when you have a valid I-94 for whatever status you're returning to. Um, so there's no restriction saying you can only use it once every year or once every three years. And of course, if you're traveling to Canada or Mexico, every month maybe they might question what you're doing in canada or mexico but technically there is no um restriction on the number of times you can use that there is just a very interesting question he uh, he filed a 485 application on eb3 and he's using the ead most probably he's not working for the same company uh with that file for the 485 application can the new company right now file the I-140 in EB-2, even though he's not maintaining the H-1B? The answer is yes. The new company can file an I-140, even though you don't have an H-1B, even though you started using the EAD, they can file an I-140 in EB-2 and get the approval. Mahesh has this question. He has gone through the 485 interview. In the interview, they have issued an RFP for the medical, which he submitted response. Now, second time, they have invited for the interview. Should he go? Yes, you should go. Don't ever not go for the interviews. And if ever you have any plans of those things, please consult an immigration lawyer before you do. In this case, it's very clear you have to go for the interview. Um, Sagar says, I got my I-140 approval a few days ago. My company is being acquired and the merger is happening at the end of the month. Would USCIS revoke the I-140 if the company no longer exists and I'm laid off by the acquiring company? So in the event of a merger where the company that sponsored the I-140 no longer exists because it's been merged into the other company, the other company is supposed to file an I-140 amendment to inform USCIS that they are the successor in interest and they're continuing the process, the job offers the same, the work location is the same, and that the new company has the ability to pay the salary. So without them filing an amendment, um, you know, would USCIS automatically revoke it? Maybe not because they may not be aware of it, but if it's a, you know, well-known name and it's made the news that this is happening, it may be on their radar and they could automatically revoke it. Um, typically, we don't really see them do that um, unless somehow they know they've been told that that company no longer exists. Question that came is that if the H1B, H4 and EAD are filed in the normal processing, will all the three get approved at the same time? The answer is yes. All the three are expected to get approved at the same time. PJ has this interesting question. His EAD extension has been filed before the EAD expired. He has the receipt notice of it. However, he has an advance for our approval for the next three months. Can he travel on the advance parole and come back even though his EAD expired, but has the receipt notice of the extension? Absolutely, you can travel. No problem with it. You have an advance parole that's valid for the next three months. You're coming back within the advance parole time. Even though your EAD extension is still pending, you can travel. I don't see any problem in there. We know this asking um, repeatedly whether we are getting the five years approval. Yeah, we started seeing the five year approval, but unfortunately, it's only for EAD at this point of time. Keep tuned. If there is any information change on that, we will inform you. But right now, it's only EAD. And if the advance parole also comes in, we will let you know as the time passes. Uh, Kaluru is a second year undergrad and is now changing from H4 to F1 and he wants to know if the SEVIS fee is required to file for that change of status 
And is it enough to submit the bank balance or does it need to provide an employment verification letter and paycheck for the parent who's on H-1B? Um, the status fee is required. Uh, so when you submit your I-539 application, you'll want to include the receipt showing that you have paid that. As far as whether a bank balance is sufficient or you need more documents, I typically file these with just bank statements. Um, and then I do normally also include the parent's pay statements because I need to show that the H-1B holder is maintaining status. So I don't really use those paychecks to show the financial aspect. I use it to show maintenance of status. Um, I don't generally get requests for evidence asking for more than that, but it's really dependent on the officer sometimes, even if the bank balance is perfect, they still ask for more documents. Um, Thomas Ann has this question. His I-140 has been approved under EB1C category. Now his question is that if he moves to a different company though, can the new company file the 485 application under the EB1C category? Unfortunately, the answer is clearly no. And they cannot even transfer, they cannot file a new I-140 to transfer because you most probably did not work for that company outside this country. You won't meet the EB1C requirement though. So given a chance though, if I'm getting double the salary with a different job right now, I am not going to move because for me, EB1C is very, very important. Ankit has this question that he and his wife are on H1B uh, and uh, he's considering doing business, so he wants his wife to move on to, to the H4 EAD. Can she move to H4 EAD without losing the job? The answer is yes. If she files for the H4 plus EAD together, H4 and EAD will be approved on the same day. So let's say her H1, H, uh, H1B is expiring in 2025. And your H1B is also expiring in 2025. And I'm assuming you have an I-140 approval. And she files H4 plus EAD together. And it's going to be approved in about three to five months. And once the H4 and EAD is approved, she can continue working. Until the H4 and EAD is still pending. Since she has the H1B valid, she can continue working. And once the H4 plus EAD is approved, you can start working on H4 EAD too. So uh, I don't see any interruption whatsoever at all for her to uh, for the for the uh, for the employment. Gorov says, "What is the normal processing time for an H and B extension?" USCIS received our case July 2020 at the California Service Center, but progress is it a good idea to do premium processing? So you can find the normal processing times on the USCIS website. If you click on the little button for case status. Uh, where you normally would enter in your receipt number, you just have to scroll below that and there'll be a little box that says check USCIS processing time. Once you click on that, first you have to click on the form number, which is going to be I-129, and then they'll have various categories of I-129. So there's one for H-1B extension of stay. Then it will ask you what service center. So you check the box for California service center. Then it will tell you that at the California service center right now, 80% of H-1B extensions are completed in two months, which is super helpful because yours has obviously been pending for longer than two months if you filed it in July. Um, so then if you scroll down a little bit further, you can enter the receipt date from your H-1B and it will tell you what the inquiry date is. So I put in July 1st, 2023 just now, assuming your case was filed on July 1st. And USCIS says, even though we're taking normally two months to process cases and your case has been clearly pending for more than two months. Your case is processing normally. Aren't you glad? Um, so it That's says that earliest, you can, <laughs> earliest you can submit questions is October 30th, 2023. And of course, only your employer can submit or the attorney can submit questions for that. So whether to do premium processing. I'm a fan of premium processing. I know some people say that it causes more RFEs. I generally don't see that, um, especially if your H-1B is expiring soon before October 31st when you can submit an inquiry or if you just want it to get over with or you need to travel or maybe your driver's license is expiring and you're in one of those states that won't let you use the receipt notice to renew your driver's license. All of those are good reasons to just go ahead and do the premium processing. 
Suresh Kumar has this question, applied multiple hedge fund registration, picked with one in the lottery. Can I drop the rest of the registrations? There is no way you can drop in the rest of the registrations. Um, people, uh, there, is an, there is a problem with people who file the multiple registration. Even if you don't ever file the hedge fund Bs at all, they may still come back and haunt you though. So uh, if you are involved in multiple registration, I strongly recommend you contact an immigration lawyer, have a plan B. At this point of time, we have not noticed any bad things going on for the people who never filed the H1B, even though after get, they get selected. But could this happen at a later time? There is a chance for it. There is a chance for it. Uh, Vijay has this interesting question. He has the H1B stamping with company A, which is expiring in 2025. And he has a H1B approval with company B, which is I-797, which is expiring in 2026. Now, can he travel to, can he travel to, uh, can he travel to uh, outside the country? And uh, can he come back using the company A's H1B approval? The, uh, the sampling, the answer is yes, you can. But when you come back into the United States, so you need to show them that you will be working with company B, you will not be working with company A, and you have to show them the 797 of company B, and you have to make sure you get an I-94 until your company B's I-797 approval, because that's very important that you do it. But we absolutely don't see any problem. Even if the company A has withdrawn the H-1B, you will not have any problem coming back into the United States. You can still use it. You don't need to go for stamping at all. Uh, I just want to also let other people know that uh, the, uh, the the USCI, uh, sorry, the State Department is coming up uh, with the um, uh, stampings of uh, uh, the passport visas will be issued within the United States, especially if you are extending the H-1Bs. You can do that. Uh, question that is coming out. Uh, uh, can we receive the 485 interview when the priority date is not current? Yes, you can receive the interview for the 485, even if the priority date is not current. Um, we, we have also noticed that some of the people who have been receiving multiple interview notices, though, and they are canceling it irrespective of um, uh, irrespective of whether or not, uh, irrespective of uh, it, even if they cancel the interview though, we still want you to go there for the interview. You never know what they're going to do it. Once you receive the interview notice, I want you to go back. Uh, I want you to go back and uh, go to the interview. Attend it if you don't do it, it's going to have negative consequences. Um, can I work for three employers uh, using the GCEAD? The answer is absolutely, you can. I know people who work for seven, eight employers. So, uh, especially in the healthcare industry, we do see that uh, those people who do moonlighting a lot, they do work. I mean, I've done 15 people working for six employers, not a problem. <clears throat> um, when, when I'm applying for the parents for the B2 application, do I need to provide the pay steps? That's up to you. I mean, they're not going to look into it. You can give it to your parents when they go for the interview. They don't normally look into those things too, at all. It depends on how much confidence your parents are there when they, when, when they go there. It gives them confidence, but it doesn't, they don't have time to look into all those documents. Vexwell has this question. Um, can we do H-1B stampings, fresh H-1B stampings in the United States? Now, when we look into the statement of uh, recently, though, it doesn't look like they're going to have an initial H-1B in the United States. It seems that only the extensions of the H-1Bs will be done. Now, I don't, since it's a pilot program, will they do it at a later date? We don't know. But initially, it looks like when they're going to start it, it's going to be only it's H-1B extensions, not initial H-1Bs. Um, Sam says, if I leave the U.S. and move to Canada uh, within a month after my I-140 is approved and I change to the employer in Canada, can I use the same H-1B and I-140 to come back to the U.S. for work in the future? It will depend completely on whether the company has withdrawn that I-140, whether they've withdrawn your H-1B, and whether that H-1B has expired. 
So if your H-1B does not get withdrawn and it has not expired and you're coming back to work for the same U.S. employer and the same job and the same work location, then you can use that same H-1B to come back. But if anything's changed about the job or if you've moved to a different company, you need to get a new H-1B. And then for the I-140, again, it just depends on whether they withdraw it or not. We do see a lot of times these large companies that have um, offices all over the place. If they send you to one of their other locations, a lot of times they cancel everything that's going on in the U.S. Um, question that came is, uh, can I, uh, Jay Kumar has this question, can I transfer my H-1B to the company that is owned by my wife who is an h 4 ead Technically, that's possible. That's possible, but I would be very, uh, I'll be very cautious about it. Though I would consult an immigration lawyer to go through if it's a good prospect or not, because normally, though, it always creates suspicion when the USCIS has a site visit and they found, oh, the wife is the employer. They get their mind blown out. They don't understand it. Um, so you just have to be careful about how to answer these people when they come in. Um, you may want to have a lawyer to speak for on behalf of you rather than you speaking. Um, so certain precautions need to be taken if your wife wants to employ you. Hey, it's going to be tough to work for your wife, though. I bet on that. <laughs> uh, uh, Thass says his EB1C I-485 was filed, and once he completes six months, can he switch employers using that EAD card? Assuming your I-140 is also approved, yes, uh, AC-21 does apply to EB1C category, even though your new employer does not have a company abroad that you've worked for, as long as the position is managerial or executive, the new company can basically take over sponsorship, well, not even sponsorship. You can move your green card process with you to the new employer because you have a valid job offer that qualifies for AC-21. The new company may need to submit a supplement J at some point, but yes, it can be done. Uh, can Arabi arriving aliens with final removal order but paroled by Immigration Customs Enforcement would be able to adjust the status? This comes from Kadim Fall. Um, our office doesn't have the expertise, uh, expertise in this matter, though. We are not, uh, we don't deal in this one. We would recommend that you contact other lawyers. We only deal in employment and fa to some extent of family based immigration. Um, P.S. says, I'm on the verge of getting my green card through employment base and my wife is in India. If I bring her on H-4 and while doing her green card process, if mine comes through, what will be her status in the next steps? Yeah, you don't want to be in that situation. Um, she obviously, once you get your green card, she's no longer in H-4 because you're no longer in H-1B. So if you have not filed her 485 yet, she goes out of status. Um, so she may have to exit the U.S. and consular process the remainder of the green card process through the follow to join category, which takes a lot longer. So you definitely need to avoid that situation at all possible cost. Um, Akash has this interesting question. His I-140 has been withdrawn after the 485 has been filed because he changed the job. Will it impact his GC approval? I'm assuming that the I-140 has been withdrawn after 180 days that your 485 has been filed. Absolutely, it will not impact. At the most, they will issue an RFE or they will, when you go for the interview, they'll ask you to submit the 485J supplement with the new company, but no negative impact whatsoever at all because the company has withdrawn the I-140. Question that but came from, go ahead. Uh, Budding Learner says, I'm on H-1B and I have two legitimate job offers from company A and B and both transfers are in process, but I've already started working for company A based on the receipt notice. What happens if my transfer to company B ends up getting approved first? Am I in trouble? No, not at all. Um, so when you have multiple petitions, um, even though you get a transfer approved, you're not required to join that company. You can stay with the company that you're already with. Um, so it becomes kind of a dormant H-1B and it's up to that company to decide whether they're going to withdraw it or not. Um, but no issues with that at all. Uh, Chandra has this question that his priority date is 2013. He was unable to find the 485. Now he's I-140 is approved. Uh, we, you just have to wait for the priority date to become current. That's all you have to do. Uh, 
Um, Kay says, I entered the U.S. on a B-1 and after five months applied for an F-1, which was denied. We filed an MTR. Can I stay here legally until we have a decision on the F MTR and what will my status be now? It's a very tricky situation because just filing the MTR does not put you in any kind of status. It doesn't make you lawfully present. So if your B-1 has already expired, um, then you are not in any status and you are accruing unlawful presence even though you filed an MTR. Now, if the MTR results in that F1 actually being reopened, from that point, it's treated as if the denial never happened and it was safe for you to remain in the country during that process. But if the motion to reopen is ultimately denied, or is unsuccessful, and by that point you've accrued 180 days or more of unlawful presence, then you're going to be stuck with a three-year bar when you exit the country. So you need to make sure to watch that 180-day clock. If your MTR is still pending at that point, it may be safer for you to exit the U.S. Um, but definitely um, talk with a qualified immigration attorney because that's a very precarious situation to be in. Um, question from um, SN. I'm a physician um, and I'm an H4 EAD. The question is, um, can I apply for the green card application while I'm on the H4 EAD? Absolutely, you should. The reason why you should apply for the uh, uh, EAD is that at a later date, you may be able to use it. And at the later date, you may be able to convert into EB1 also at a later date. So definitely on a definitely on a H4 EAD, you can file a green card application. You don't need to be an H1B to file a green card application though. Lurie says, my H1B was withdrawn by Amazon in July. How do I reinstate to my F1 STEM OPT? I don't have the withdrawal acknowledgement. Um, first, check with your school to see if on October 1st your service record was terminated. Most likely it was if USCIS has not processed the withdrawal yet. And in that situation, you need to let your DSO know that the H-1B has been withdrawn and they need to request a data fix to uh, reopen your service record and put you back in that OPT. The problem is ICE usually requires that withdrawal confirmation. So you're going to be in limbo until you get the withdrawal confirmation and the data fix is actually accomplished. Um, so that means you can't travel, you won't be able to get a new I-20 um, for uh, to show that you're actually back in F1 status. Uh, Amir is asking the question that online status says that it's beyond processing time and his firm application is 350 days. Uh, can he do an inquiry at this point of time? Well, the government lies most of the time. Uh, in this case, they definitely lies. Uh, no, the processing time is about 365 days right now. That's where the processing time is. So if it's 350 days, I would wait 100, 370, 380 days before I start inquiring about it. Uh, Sanjeev says, for an AP that's past the normal processing time, does talking to Emma help or what else can be done? So if it's actually past the normal processing time and uh, when you enter your receipt date on the USCIS website and it tells you the inquiry date, um, you can actually do an inquiry, then you can submit a service request without using Emma. You can just do it through the e-request option. Um, that's one thing you can do, but we don't really see a lot of uh, help from these e-requests. Um, you could try contacting the Ombudsman office. You could try contacting your senator or congressman. Most of the time we end up having to file lawsuits in that situation. Emily, I want to debate with you about the question that Kaluri Kaushik has raised here. Uh, his H-1B was been approved by Amazon. They have withdrawn the H-1B in F-1. And now, what is the best option for him? Should he go back? Should he take the confirmation? Because Amazon is taking a lot, uh, the USCIS is, takes a lot of time to issue the confirmation to Amazon. And he has to take that confirmation to the, to the DSO to reinstate himself in SMOPT. Should he do that or just ignore the withdrawal because it's not been withdrawn back to the first? Move on to a different company as if that he's an H-1B. 
Yeah, I'm a fan of sticking with the H-1B. Um, you know, with this whole lottery situation, it's very difficult for people to get selected in the lottery. Um, if you forego the H-1B this year to go back to your OPT STEM, that means next year you're going to have to go through the lottery. And what if you don't get selected? This was your, maybe this was your only chance. And so I've been able to file H-1B transfers for people after October 1st, before November 30th, and argue that they're in the 60 day grace period, even though uh, the H-1B has been withdrawn because it's not actually been processed by USCIS. Yeah, it's, it's a judgment call that you have to make that, but I am also with Emily, I will choose to go with H-1B. I don't want to go through the lottery system again. I would choose to go with it in the other option. People would do it, wait until the confirmation comes in, take that to the DSO and reinstate yourself. They call it as a data correction. But anybody who is in a position where they they lost the job before October 1st, though, I would strongly recommend that to consult a lawyer to evaluate all the options and take an independent uh, decision what you would do at a later date. Um, I'm, Satish is planning to purchase a Tesla and he wants to use the EV credit. Will that impact the 485 interview? Absolutely not. I'm a big fan of Tesla, go for it. Uh, go for it. Uh, you take the EV credit, it's not going to create any problem Absolutely not. It's not going to create any problem. Uh, back in olden days, when it was in 2018, I took the EV credit and I got it and I was fine with it. Now, I'm not an H-1B, but even if I were an H-1B, it will not negatively impact. Now, there are certain benefits the income tax offers, guys. For example, 401k, take it. You can take it. You can avail that thing. Uh, you, since you bought the Tesla, you're taking the EV credit. Absolutely not a problem. Hey, go for it. Tesla is a good car. Uh, Mohammed says, I applied for my H-1 extension almost 90 days ago. There was no response, so I asked my company to do premium processing. Now it's been almost eight days and still no response. Is that normal? Well, it depends on what you mean by eight days and no response, um, because once the premium processing is accepted, the government has 15 days in order to either make a decision or issue a request for evidence. So if it's only been eight days, then it's normal that you haven't heard anything yet. But if you're saying that it's been eight days and they've not even accepted the premium processing, that's unusual. So you wanna make sure that the package was properly delivered, that the I-907 was complete, signed, filled out correctly, that there's no problem with the filing fee check. If the filing fee check has been cashed, then everything's fine. Um, but if the check has not been cashed after eight days, that is not usually normal. Yen Guru has this question, since it's taking a long time to process the uh, labor form application, which is also called as 9089 form, um, can we go to the B2 and once the I-140 is approved, can we come back to the H-1B? Uh, will that be a problem? Oh, yeah, you can do that. Absolutely. We do that for a lot of people, though. Uh, for a lot of people, we do conversion into B2 and come back into uh, H-1B. Have never seen any problem at all. It may be a good option for you to consider if your green card is not getting approved. And one more thing for the people is that please, it's taking two plus years for the entire green card process. Try to do that as early as possible. All right, well, it looks like we're out of time for today. Thanks everyone for joining us. Don't forget to um, subscribe to our YouTube channel so you'll get the latest updates and know when we go live. And you can also subscribe to our newsletter at rnlawgroup.com so that you can get our latest updates every Wednesday when we send out our newsletter. And thank you for giving the opportunity with your questions uh, in this one. And we do also have a daily conference call. You guys can come in. The link is provided there. These kind of things will not only educate you, but they also educate us because there's questions that you pose also educate how we need to be prepared for those answers. So it educates, it makes our mind very sharp. Being an immigration lawyer, I'm very proud that you are giving us the opportunity to answer the question. But if you want to consult any of our uh, lawyers, me, Emily, or anybody in the office, so the link is there. Our schedule is available there. You can block a time that shoots to you. The link is provided at the bottom. Thank you very much.